Hello and welcome to Written in Uncertainty, an Elder Scrolls podcast sat firmly in the grey maybe of the series universe. My name is Aramithius, and today we're discussing a type of event that can do pretty much anything. It's been known to reshape gods, redraw country boundaries, and is a fundamental violation of the laws of physics and time itself. Today we're asking, what are dragon breaks? I'd just like to have our usual disclaimer here, just to remind everyone that this is my own understanding of the idea and not necessarily the whole truth of the matter, although I'll do my best to bring in other viewpoints as well. If you have other ideas, I'd absolutely love to hear them. Please leave a comment on the blog post that accompanies this cast at writteninuncertainty.wordpress.com or join the conversation at the Written in Uncertainty Discord. Also, a quick note about the blog, I'll also be linking all the sources that I'm quoting in this podcast in the blog post, so if you haven't found it already, please go through and read the sources that I'm linking rather than just taking what I say at face value. So, what are Dragon Breaks? Basically, they're where time stops working properly, where time becomes totally non-linear, and you get chains of events and causalities that don't really make sense. You have some of the sources talking about people giving birth to their own grandfathers. It's where events don't necessarily need to have a cause and they don't really link up properly, where time is totally broken. This means that you can get multiple contradictory outcomes from a single event and people's perception of what's going on is even more unreliable than usual. Uh, There are a few caveats to this, which I'll get to as we go through, but that's basically what a dragon break is. It's where time goes completely out the window, everything happens in a totally unregulated order, and pretty much anything can happen. Why is it like this? It's because of the nature of time in the Elder Scrolls universe. Akatosh is the time god, Uh, You've got several sources, the monomyth and before the ages of man, most particularly, saying that Akatosh is the cause of time. The monomyth says, when Akatosh forms, time begins. Before the ages of man has Akatosh, Auriel, formed and time began. There's this inherent link in the Elder Scrolls between Akatosh or Auriel or the Akatusk, which is the whole thing we'll get to a little later, that the time god and time are much more linked than they are in most fantasy or real world mythologies. And this means that because the Elder Scrolls is so reliant on entities, on things and personalities for its time, that it can be broken. You can push things to the point where Akatosh can't handle what's going on anymore and time goes completely out the window. That's what dragon breaks are. One thing that they aren't is alternative timelines. They are time without time. It means that you don't need to have a full chain of cause and events. It doesn't mean that you've got everything happening in a logical order in a different way, all next to each other in parallel worlds and that sort of thing. The Elder Scrolls themselves, the actual physical scrolls within the Elder Scrolls universe, are kind of connected to them, maybe? We've got a quote from the book Where Were You When the Dragon Broke, which says, Even the Elder Scrolls do not mention it. Let me correct myself. The Elder Scrolls cannot mention it. When the Moth Priests attune the scrolls to the timeless time, their glyphs always disappear. So, dragon breaks are something that is inherently unresolved, that you can't even think about in terms of the very fuzzy nature of prophecy as you get put forward with the Elder Scrolls. It's a total blank and there's no rules at all. And I think we can get some really decent insight into what that means and the consequences of that by looking at a particular name that Dragon Breaks have been given. Both Vivek and the Murakati Selective call Dragon Breaks the Hurling Disc which has a variety of interesting implications. If you think about the structure of Mundus as a wheel, and the eight Adra, the eight Giflims, as Vivek calls them, as the things that go to make up Mundus, those eight form the spokes of the wheel, 
a disc is a wheel without spokes. So it's a breaking of the Aedra and how they work. And so it's a total suspension of physics. It's almost breaking the Aedra rather than just breaking the dragon, if you think about that. And you can do various things with that. The Maracati selectives say are in on the detachment of the sheath from the integument. Upon intercourse with the star orphan, the beseeching Alistic performs a version of the organ of thought, an employment of the hurling disc that recapitulates the truth that a circle turned sideways is a tower. And remember that that hints to the fundamental nature of the Arabis and is potentially, therefore, a walking way. The core realisation of Chim, for example, is that the wheel is the tower and is therefore I, and they, it's the same thing, and that sort of thing. If you want a bit more of my thoughts on that, please go back and look at my podcast on what is Chim and all the consequences of that. And so now we know roughly what Dragon Breaks are and what they can do, we can now look at how do they happen, what causes the dragon to be broken in quite this way. I just first want to take a step back and go out of universe and talk about how they came about as a conceptual idea for the Elder Scrolls games. They were initially devised to to solve a canonicity problem that happened after the Elder Scrolls 2 Daggerfall because you could have multiple endings to that game. They had the question of, well, which ending do we make the canon ending? And they didn't really want to nullify player experiences there. They didn't want to say that if anyone played the game any particular way, they're playing it wrong. So they said, right, let's make, just make all of the endings, the canon endings to Daggerfall. And so they came up with the idea of when the new medium was reactivated at the end of the Elder Scrolls 2, it broke the dragon, time was suspended, all of the endings were possible. I also think that it was also used to cover up a continuity error that Bethesda didn't really want in there. I don't know for sure about this, but it feels that way. If you look at the dates of when the Elysian Order ruled Tamriel and did various things with it, they don't match up. You've got some that say it was over a thousand years, and you've got some that say it was a matter of a few hundred. The key source for this and how it kicked off, I think, was the first edition of the Pocket Guide to the Empire, which says this. Nearly a third of the first era passed under their theocratic rule, that is, the rule of the Elysian Order. When its priesthood had become too widespread to support itself, the Order began to fight amongst itself. With the severance of the territories of West Cyrodiil from the Empire, too much money and land had been lost. The War of Righteousness broke out, and the Order, which had almost ruled the world, undid itself in a ten-year span. Now, if you look at the history of the First Era, the First Empire, founded by Elysia herself, started in the 242nd year of the first era so you're looking at nearly a third of the first era which lasted over all 2920 years so you're looking at a time span of around 973 years or so which would put us to something like oh, my ma- my quick math is terrible 1,100 and so in the first era. But we've also got this pointing to the end of the order in the first edition pocket guide to the Empire in the section on Cyrodiil. Things persisted in this vein until the Thracian plague of the year 2200 of the first era, see Free Regions Thrace, which decimated more than half of Tamriel's population, particularly the western coastlands closest to Thrace. After Bendu Olu, the Colovian king of Anvil, led the All Flags navy to victory over the slug folk of Thrace, the glory of the Cyrodiilic people became known throughout the world. The Colovian estates began to overshadow the richer, more populous east then, which eventually led to the War of Righteousness that ended Elysian rule. So you've got Elysian rule ending sometime after the year 2200, 
And so that means that the Elysian order has to ha be some years distant, some centuries distant, in fact, from the original Elysian rebellion. But you've also got texts like this. You've got Rislav the Righteous, which is a, a book that first appeared in Oblivion, I think, which is a point I'll get to a bit later, but I'll give the quote now. There is a brief reference to him, together with his family, as part of the roles of honour during the coronation of Emperor Gorius in the 23rd of Sun's Dawn, 1st era 461. It was the beginning of the end of the Elysian hegemony. The kings of the Colovian West joined with Kavach and Skingrad to resist imperial incursions. But remember that the Elysian rebellion that began the First Empire only happened in the first era 242. So you're, if you're getting the beginnings of the end of the Elysian order in 461, which then ended a ten year, in a 10-year span, as per the pocket guide, you're looking at much less than the thousand years or so, or 973, or however the maths works out, to divvy up a third of the first era. It's only a matter of a few centuries here. So that's one of the reasons for the mess up. I can't find the original source where the mistake was made, because the only time I can find the shorter period of the Elysian Order's rule is in Rislav the Righteous, which didn't doesn't appear until the Elder Scrolls IV. So it's a little unclear as to how this was originally brought about, but I know that that was very probably the reason that it was. And there was also a nod to this in-universe in the text, The Dragon Break Re-Examined by Faldrun, which points out that the mess up with the years for the Dragon Break in the first era, which is incidentally also called the Middle Dawn, is down to a scholarly error in transcription, a misunderstanding of how the Elysian year cycle worked. So in fact, they would have had only a few hundred actual years, whereas the 1008 that is claimed was actually a cycle of how the different priests were appointed and not appointed and so on and so forth. But there's kind of a gag in this one, in that Faldrun's book, The Dragon Break Reexamined, appears in the Elder Scrolls III in Morrowind, which is set in the 427th year of the Third Era. And it would then finish off the Third Era with the Oblivion Crisis a few years later. But the book itself starts off with, to quote, The late Third Era was a period of remarkable religious ferment and creativity. The upheavals of the reign of Uriel VII were only the outward signs of the historical forces that would eventually lead to the fall of the Septim dynasty. And at the end of the book, it says, Today, modern archaeology and paleonumerology have confirmed what my own research in Elysian dating first suggested, that the Dragon Break was invented in the late Third Era based on a scholarly error, fueled by obsession with eschatology and New Medianism, and perpetuated by scholarly inertia. That's a little weird if you think about the context in which the book is supposedly published. We don't know the exact date of publication when we read it in the Elder Scrolls 3, but it may well have been around for a few years before we find it, but it's already talking about the late Third Era and the fall of the Septim Dynasty as if it's already happened, and also talks about the events of the late Third Era at the end, like it's some period that's long ago that... Uh, a lot of stuff has been talked about and discussed and so on and so forth. But we're already in the third era in the Elder Scrolls III, and the Septim Dynasty hasn't ended yet. So this book comes from somewhere else. It comes from the future, which means that there's been some bending of time in order for it to be here in the first place. So it's arrived as the result of a dragon break almost, so its central claim is very obviously false. And you've also got the fact that if you take Faldrun's name, it's an anagram of darn fool. It's not meant to be something that is taken as the truth or a serious argument at all. It, its very presence in the game refutes itself. 
but it's a little bit less apparent in Skyrim when it appears because the third era has already ended and has been ended for some time. We would have expected these this kind of tone of writing about the late third era and the end of the Septim dynasty to have been something in Skyrim's time, but not in Morrowind. So it's quite plainly not scholarly error or simple magic or misperception when it happens in universe. It's something else that's quite serious. When dragon breaks happen in Tamriel, they almost always happen because of the Numidium in some way. We've only got one example of a confirmed dragon break that didn't involve the Numidium, which is the Middle Dawn in the first era with the Murakati selectives. And we'll go through the examples of the known dragon breaks that we have in a second, but I just wanted to flag that when these things happen, and potentially as a cause for them in quite a few of their cases, it's as a tool for apotheosis and to change how the world works. It's quite occasionally something that's deliberately done. We have a quote from the commentaries on the Mysterian Xarxes that acknowledges this as it talks about the Nimoli, which is... That is your ward against the Nimoli. They run blue through noise and shine only when the earth trembles with the eruption of the newly mantled. We know elsewhere from various sources that are primarily things that Michael Kirkbride has written that Nimoli only appear during dragon breaks. But why would they call something the eruption of the newly mantled if you're referring to dragon breaks? unless it's to do with the creation of gods. Mantling itself is a process where mortals can become gods in the Elder Scrolls. I will talk about it in a future episode. I'm aware I've probably said this about three times now that I need to do an episode on mantling, but I will get to it. But why would they talk about the newly mantled unless the dragon breaks themselves were used as a tool to become gods. And I'll talk through some examples of the dragon breaks that we know about now, and so you can see how they've been used in that way. The Middle Dawn is the first one, chronologically, if you, I can use such a word to talk about dragon breaks at all. This is the dragon break. It's remembered by every culture on Tamriel. It affected everyone. If we are to believe the book, where were you when the dragon broke? We have this quote. Every culture on Tamriel remembers the dragon break in some fashion. To most it is a spiritual anguish that they cannot account for. Several texts survive this timeless period, all unsurprisingly conflicting with each other regarding events, people and regions. Wars are mentioned in some that never happened in another. The sun changes colour depending on the witness, and the gods either walk among mortals or they don't. Even the 1,008 years, a number some say arbitrarily chosen by the Elder Council, is an unreliable measure. Whether or not the secret masters of the Murakati Selective were successful is unknown, and any records of their survival were destroyed by the War of Righteousness that ended the Elysian Order a hundred years later. So even here we've got the confusion of quite when the Order ended. It sounds from this like they're suggesting that the Order ended a hundred years after the Dragon Break, which feels very, very strange. But anyway, this Dragon Break was done by the Murakati Selectives, which were a group of fanatical, monolatristic worshippers of Akatosh in order to change the nature of Akatosh according to Where Were You When the Dragon Broke? To quote again, A fanatical sect of the Elysian Order, the Murakati Selective, becomes frustrated by ancient old Mary traditions still present within the theological system of the Eight Divines. Specifically, they hated any admission that Akatosh, the Supreme Spirit, was indisputably also Oriel, the Elven High God. Newly invented rituals were utilised to disprove this theory to no avail. Finally, the secret masters of the Murakati Selective channeled the Arabis itself to mythically remove those aspects of the dragon god they disapproved of. A staff or tower appeared before them. The secret masters danced on it until it writhed and trembled and spoke its protonymic. 
The tower split into eight pieces and time broke. The non-linearity of the Dawn era had returned. Now, it's one thing to note from this is that it again equates the eight pieces of the staff with the spokes of the Aedra and a non-linearity with non-reality in a way. If I was to put my tinfoil hat on here, it's potentially saying that the nature of the Arabis is unreal in itself, that the way that the Arabis exists at the moment is a lie, is not the truth, which is also hinted at in the 36 Lessons of Vivek and the Truth in Sequence. The 36 Lessons talks about how Anu and his double, which love knows never really happened. And the truth in sequence talks repeatedly about Anu being the only real reality and Padme being a lie. We have this particular note from the Elysian order themselves, from the selectives themselves, that kind of states their purpose for breaking the dragon here. To quote, it is the first of the exclusionary mandates that the Supreme Spirit Akatosh is of unitary essence, as is inconclusively proven by the monolinearity of time. And clearly, the arc of time provides us with the mortal theatre for the act of sacred expungement. Thus, it is our purpose upon Mundus to reverse the error of Sanctus Primus and restore Ak at Osh to humididic purity. To say otherwise is vain and empty persiflage. So for the Murakati, that one humanity or that one truth is that humans are supposed to dominate. Our humans are the single truth of the world, which is a little weird, to be frank, given that Maruk himself is an Imga, is an ape man rather than an actual human. The Middle Dawn is also referred to as the Selectives dancing on the tower. There's a question of which tower. It's not really like you can dance on the Staff of Towers itself. It's a little tricky to dance as a group on an object like that. So we're mostly assuming that they used an actual tower as part of this. And that was the only real answer for a, what, for a while. And so it's commonly thought that given the focus of the Elysian Empire in Cyrodiil, was that the tower that they used was white gold, which, as we discussed in our episode looking at the towers, is probably the best one to do this sort of thing with. It's built with the wheel of the Arabis as part of its structure, so you can start using it as a fetish to adjust how things happen within the Arabis. We also have a bit more on the Staff of Towers, particularly from the Elder Scrolls Online. We've learnt in ESO Somerset that the Staff of Towers was built by the Aeliads, who also built the White Gold Tower. It's very, very in keeping with what we know of the Aeliads as a people and how they thought about the world. They were very, very aware of the nature of towers as things to use to dominate and control particular areas of Tamriel. So it's kind of fitting that they would build a staff to do something very similar. I also like the symbolism that the staff of towers has gained through ESO. There's a quote from the Lawmaster's archive which talks about it in these terms. The greatest of these threats was a fanatical schism of the Elysians called the Murakati Selectives. Archprelate Favidius learned that the zealots of the Selective were scheming to bring about some kind of mystical re-engineering of the Arabis by finding and combining the eight parts of an artefact called the Staff of Towers. These segments had been deliberately separated and hidden early in the first era due to the threat posed by the complete staff. Now this is kind of interesting, again, if you think about the eight pieces being the eight divines or something similar, the eight Aedra, the gift limbs, the Staff of Towers is a mirror of the hurling disc itself. You combine the eight into one, you have the power to break the dragon, you combine all of the 
eight spokes of the wheel of the Arabis into one, you have the hurling disc, which is a dragon break. And it's quite possible that this is why we've got this one being the only dragon break that we know of that doesn't involve the new medium. The Staff of Towers itself was something that was designed to do that, and the new medium was possibly built to serve a similar function later. I'm not so sure it was its absolute intent give in the way that it seems to be for the Staff of Towers, but it's... I don't think it's exactly a happy accident, let's put it that way. If you want to hear more of my thoughts on how and why the new medium was built, I talk about that in the first substantive cast of this series when I talk about what happened to the Dwemer. The next dragon break that we know of is one that's come to be called the Red Moment, which is a name for the dragon break that happened at Red Mountain during the Battle of Red Mountain in the 700th year of the First Era. The term the Red Moment is generally one that's been coined by fans and it's been that way for several years, although it has been referred to in that way by Sermon 37 of the 36 Lessons of Vivek. And in this particular dragon break, it was used by the tribunal to make them gods, or at least in theory. We have a fantastic phrase from the trial of Vivek, which was a forum role play that was done by several members of the community and several developers in 2004 on the official Bethesda forums. In it, we have Vivek saying this, As Vec and Vec, I hereby answer my right and my left with black hands. Vec the mortal did murder the Hortator. Vec the god did not and remains as written. And yet these two are the same being, and yet they are not, save for one red moment. And that came to be used as the term for the dragon break at Red Mountain, which was a way for people to explain the many and various accounts of the Battle of Red Mountain that exist. So we have what appears to be an admission by Vivek that Z used a dragon break in order to become gods in some way, or become a god. This is a little weird in that it doesn't really seem to tally with what we know of how the tribunal entirely became gods. The conventional understanding is that they used the tools of Kagranak on the heart of Lorcan, but... We've also got accounts that say that that happened several years after the Battle of Red Mountain, and that means that the Red Moment extended quite a way beyond the actual battle itself, which doesn't really feel right, at least not to me. However, it does match up with the dissenting heterodox accounts that we get, such as Nerevar at Red Mountain and similar, that talk about the tribunal becoming gods at Red Mountain, and then the Kaima becoming the Dunma, and so on and so forth, as a result of that. We've also got Sermon 37, which talks an awful lot about when the light bent, which talks about, which and then presents quite a series of potential alternative timelines for how Vivek's life could have unfolded had it not been for becoming a god, which presents lots of possible alternatives and multiple timelines, which gets a bit more into the kind of multiverse thing that ESO seems to be driving for with how it presents crystal-like lore, rather than strictly a dragon break itself, unless you want to start considering Vivek's whole life a dragon break, which seems a little bit of a stretch, to be honest. But Whenever it actually happened, I think what from what we can see from the trial of Vivek, the red moment is intended to be the moment of the tribunal's apotheosis, where you've got Vec the mortal and Vec the god being in the same place at once. This is explicitly put forward at another point in the trial, which says that when Vec the mortal reached into the heart, he ceased to be anything except for what he wished to be. The axis erupted. There was an exact cracking, 
an instant of pure arbus, his hands burnt black by that ever nil of static change, and Vivek the god, who had never been, had always been. A whole universe swelled up to legitimise his throne, as the old universe, where Vec the mortal still lapped up God's blood, warped itself into accept its new equivalent. And like all things magical, it simply could not happen, could not be. Red Mountain was the intersection of the is, is not, as it was of old, its centre point, and it did not hold. And so the dragon, having broken, saw fit to heal, turning into the world you know. Except now Vivek the god was alive before his own birth, which had, in fact, really happened in the death of the last universe. Now this passage is beautiful because it has an awful lot of stuff about how Vivek sees himself being coming a god and how that was, how that felt in a way. But it also to me brings up a concept that's quite central to how ritual is understood in anthropology. This concept is called liminality. It's something that gets invoked when there's boundaries to be crossed, stages of life to be moved from one to the other. So birth is a liminal state, marriage is a liminal state, or coming of age, sorry, is the next stage along, then marriage, then death. They're all times in one's life where you cross from being one thing, so a young person to an old person or a mature person, from being a single person to a married person, and from being an alive person to being a dead person. It's liminal events and liminal rituals bring things into an in-between space where they can transition. And you have quite a bit of literature talking about how that space is managed, how that threshold state, that in-betweenness is presented. And that's what Vivek is talking about here. It's using the dragon break as a liminal space where it's not definitely one thing, it's not definitely another. And so you can bridge the bits between mortals and gods. We have a good quote on this from the third volume of the commentaries on the Mysterium Xarxes, which is, The tower touches all mantles of heaven, brother Noviate, and by its apex one can be as he will. More be as he was, and yet changed for all else on that path for those that walk after. This is the third key of Numantia, and the secret of how mortals become makers, and makers back to mortals. That phrasing is very, very liminal in how it's applied. The tower, which if we go back to the thoughts on the staff of towers and the wheel, the hurling disc, is constructed as a place where mortals become, can become makers, can become gods, and makers become mortals. And if you think about how the Mundus was created, you had to have that space where gods could then step down to become the Elnafe, to become mortal. And that all happened as part of the dawn, fallout from the Dawn era, which is that liminal in-between space as well. So we can see that if you start to break time, if you break causality, you can make things flex and then they won't snap back into place quite right or quite as they were before. That you can make yourself into something much greater because you are going back to a state of premundus almost. You're going back to a state where you can become a god, where you perhaps are a god in some sense because you are in that place where the is is not intersect, that you can manipulate the maybe in a way that you can't when time is running normally. The next dragon break after that was the activation of the new medium for Tiber Septim or by Tiber Septim as part of his conquest of Tamriel. Now we really don't have a lot about the effects of this in the books that we have. We know that the Numidian was used by Tiber Septim as part of his conquest of Tamriel, most particularly when he attacked Somerset, but 
the actual dragon break itself we know very little about. The con consequences of the armistice with the Dunma and getting the Numidium and so on, and then the unification of Tamriel is quite well documented. The dragon break itself isn't really. I can only actually find two sources on it, the first of which, and the most comprehensive as which, if you can really call it that, is Where Were You When the Dragon Broke, which is a Khajiit talking to a, an Imperial Blades agent about what happened during the warp in the West. And the quote goes like this. We will give you credit. You broke Alkosh something fierce, and that's not easy. Just don't think you solved what you accomplished by it, or can ever solve it. You did it again with Big Walker, not once but twice. Once at Rimmon, which we'll never learn to live with. The second time was in Daggerfall, or was it Sentinel, or was it Wayrest, or was it in all three places at once? Now, the reference to Daggerfall, Sentinel, and Wayrest is the Elder Scrolls II Daggerfall. But the point about Rimmon is what I want to talk about here. It's where the bits of the Numidium got taken and then assembled and prior to Tiber's using it to conquer Tamriel. It was done in the Hall of the Colossus, from what we can tell, and is talked about in those terms in Skeleton Man's interview. To quote, don't let Marshy lie to you about Big Walker. The Blades took it from here, sure, but they didn't take it back to Cyrodiil and rebuild the thing. Talos, he annexed a swath of our bounty land in Anaquinal and cleared the Khajiiti out by force. That's where he built the Hall of the Colossus, a mighty name for a secret testing warehouse. And that's where Big Walker was born. And that's why that part of our elsewhere is still poisoned glow rock where no cats go. Aside from being a really interesting image that the assembly and activation of the Numidium creates Tamriel's equivalent of a nuclear wasteland, it also shows us that something very, very serious went down when the Numidium was turned on. And it's been equated with a dragon break in Where Were You When the Dragon Broke? And to an extent expanded on by Michael Kirkbride when he talks about the Siege of Alinor and how that was, in the same time, resolved in an hour and also going on for centuries afterwards. I don't have the text that talks about that to hand right now, but I will be linking it in the blog post that goes alongside this episode so you can check out what he says. He puts forward some very, very cool ideas about the use of different types of magic by the Ultima to try and combat the Numidium and how they can carry on fighting for that long against such a big and imposing thing. Uh, there's also part of me that thinks this is potentially another another cover-up that there was a continuity slip between Daggerfall and the rest when we think about Tiber's conquests and how it was done. In The Real Baron Zaya Part 2, we've got this particular quote that talks about when Mournhold was attacked by the Empire. Sometime after came a day when Baron Zaya was shaken awake by her nurse, dressed hurriedly and carried from the palace. All that she remembered of that, that dreadful time was seeing a huge shadow with burning eyes that filled the sky. That doesn't jive with the general account of how Morrowind was incorporated into the Empire either. The official way of putting it, and pretty much every other kind of narrative at all, for this talks about Morrowind being incorporated into the Empire by treaty that the Empire never actually invaded. So we have this just this one reference of the Numidian potentially being used on Morrowind as well, which is very, very weird. And thanks ever so much to Cyfri for pointing this bit out to me. It, it's just very, very easy to miss if you look at the text and just carry on focusing on the Baron Zaya narrative rather than what all the little details might mean. So it's possible that the new medium was used elsewhere other than Somerset and then retroactively only used against Somerset in some way, shape or form. It's a very, very difficult to get hold of Dragon Break in terms of thinking about how it was used and when 
because everything is so swept up in the narrative of Tiber's triumphant conquest of Tamriel and how everything's wonderful now. The next one is the one that caused them all, potentially, which was the warp in the West. It's the end of The Elder Scrolls II, um, and as I've already said, it was a way to make all of the endings of that game true without the need for a single specific canon ending as such. Again, it was caused by the new medium's activation, and we have quite a few instances of apotheosis off the back of this. We have Manimarko becoming the necromancer's moon, becoming a god, and stalking RK and doing all sorts of terrible, nasty things to him, I'm sure. And we also have the appearance of Talos after this event, which was potentially a result of the warp in the West. This is, again, another potential retcon in how it's been dealt with. Talos wasn't mentioned at all before Daggerfall, and or not really much mentioned in Daggerfall itself either, and or at least not as a god. And so this has been concocted as a way of fans to think that Talos was assembled out of several different parts following the warp in the west. At the end of the Elder Scrolls II Daggerfall, you reunite all the various bits of Zirin Arctus's soul in one of the endings. The Underking becomes one whole person again. And that compilation completes the triumvirate that is Talos in the Arcturian Heresy. And so with those three now potentially able to be together again, you can get all three bits of the Talos Oversoul smashed together to be a god in the way that it wasn't before. And this Dragon Break is also one of the reshaping kingdoms bits in the same way that it was used in the original Tiber Wars. It was used by every single political faction that was trying to create a space for itself around the Iliac Bay. And so you had everyone grabbing it and smashing against the other new medium coming the other way, probably. And so you get everyone expanding out and eventually settling down into much more stable kingdoms because everyone wins in that sense. And have there been any other dragon breaks that we know of in Tamriel? There's the potential cop-out answer here that is that records aren't really straight in Dragon Breaks, they can't be made straight. So any potential instance where we've got conflicting records, we've got a potential Dragon Break. But the amount of power that you need to be able to make a Dragon Break happen means that I think that's very, very unlikely. We've got two possible instances of Dragon Breaks, one of which I think is more likely than the other. Uh, the first one is the time wound in the Elder Scrolls V. We've got from Alduin's first banishment, him being flung forward through time by the use of an Elder Scroll to the end of the, well, not the end of the Fourth Era, to 200 years after the beginning of the Fourth Era. And that's been called a dragon break by some fans because it's stuff being disrupted and it's the normal flow of time being disrupted although I don't really think so, because it's just Alduin disappears and Alduin appears again. And between those two points, we've got fairly consistent records. You've got a regular flow of, causa of causality. So unless Dragon Breaks can only affect particular bits of people and particular parts of, of the world, then I don't think this particularly works as a dragon break. And you've got the notion of the Middle Dawn being something that affected all of Tamriel. Again, with the warp in the West, it affected whole kingdoms. These are big events. I don't think that they're particularly easily contained in the way that this particular theory would suggest. But it is a possibility, although... Again, the fundamental nature of Alduin's displacement through time doesn't really feel quite right to me in the context of what a dragon break is. 
We've also got the events of the Elder Scrolls Online and some dialogue from the Prophet quite explicitly implies this. If you can have an explicit implication, my words are getting a little fuzzy at this point. But the quote from the Prophet is, It's good to see you again, and I do see you in my own way. You are a wound in time, a tear in reality that shouldn't exist and cannot long endure. Now, there... That feels to me like a good way of describing a dragon break. The specifics of the Elder Scrolls V's time wound aside, a wounded time is a really interesting way of thinking about what a dragon break is. It's where time can't function properly, it's where time is damaged. And the nature of ESO as an MMO, as something where you've got multiple players mucking around doing lots of different things over and over again in the same way in the same line and interacting with each other in a way that wouldn't really be possible if it was just one particular narrative that was happening at one particular time feels very very like a dragon break it's also a way that bethesda can potentially use to explain the lack of any reliable records from or about the alliance war it's one of those areas where a dragon break can be used to fill plot holes. And you can also look at various other bits. I've seen some bits from Dover Sebrom in the Elder Scrolls wiki pointing out that prior to the events of the Elder Scrolls Online, we've got accounts of different people summoning Wolfarth in order to help with the Akaviri invasion. This would ordinarily be something I would chalk up to inaccurate records or potentially people trying to take credit for things where credit um, where credit is a good thing to have but in this case because Wolfarth is such a singular figure and such a nationalistic figure in some ways I think a dragon break almost fits here because you've got Al Malexia summoning him to help out and then you've got Joran summoning him with the help of the Greybeards to help out. So it's potentially, I don't know whether you want to call it a foretremor or something of the dragon break that happens around the Alliance War and the Plain Meld and everything else that, that went on throughout the events of the Elder Scrolls Online. It's now I think about it, it could almost work with the timeline of the Soul Burst being the catalyst for that. The mucking around with um, obl- with Oblivion and all the other various bits that Madame Arco was up to during the Soul Burst, that could almost work. I'd have, um, can, please can someone check the dates on that for me to see whether it actually lines up? Because that would be a really good way of explaining why we've got different people summoning Wolfarth at various points. And again, summoning Wolfarth is something that I don't think people would really want to take credit for. It's not really something that is a good thing to have or something that you really want to shout about when you recount your tales of the Akaviri War. So I don't see any reason for these characters or the chroniclers or wherever they heard the message from to be lying about it in this instance. So we've got a potential dragon break there. That's the dragon breaks that we know about for now, but there are a few other elements that are adjacent to or part of Dragon Breaks that I want to discuss before we fully wrap this up. They are different types of creatures primarily that appear to be associated with Dragon Breaks. We are going to talk about the Nimoli and the Jills. First of all, the Nimoli. These are associated with the Magna Gay. Potentially they are Magna Gay and they only appear during Dragon Breaks. We have this from the exegesis of the Merid Nunda. To quote, The best known of these star orphans is probably Nimoli the Blue Star, who is associated with untime events and was said to be visible even in the daytime sky at the time of the Dragon Break. Which is kind of interesting because you have another signifier here of what a dragon break is. If you can see a blue star in the sky, it's definitely a dragon break. It also potentially links dragon breaks to Aetherius as a place. The Magna Gay escapes to Aetherius, and if the Nimoli is or are 
a magna gay. We'll get to that plural singular thing in a second. If the Minamoli are a magna gay and they have some association with dragon breaks, then you can say, well, dragon breaks are linked to Ethereus in a way that normal time isn't. And we also have is part of the ritual to break the dragon in the detachment of the sheath. There is an invocation of the Nimoli and the star orphan and those various other phrases that indicate that the Nimoli are potentially used as part of what the selectives were up to, whether that means that they form a constituent part of a dragon break. I'm not totally sure because we don't have much information on them at all, but it's an interesting little thought anyway. We also have a few comments from Michael Kirkbride on these that he's made on forums and so on to kind of elaborate on what they are and how they can exist. And um, we have this, first of all. Uh, Mnemonic magic is related to the star orphans, gods and heroes and demons that live between creations, which can include those reality-bending burps known as dragon breaks. Think of them as the all-stars between Kalpas, if that helps. Now, I'm not going to open the Kalpas can of worms at this point in the cast. That's going to be done on another cast. But if they are things that exist between times, and can act as a way of compiling and telling stories in those between times. The Namali can potentially be the things that we talked about earlier, the threshold things. You need them on your side if you want to change things over to put from one thing to another, maybe. That's purely my thoughts on them being used as the champions of Dragon Breaks in how Kirkbride describes them here. Um, we've also got him describing them as the keepers of the Elder Scrolls in an IRC chat that he did some years ago. I'll be linking both of these in the blog post alongside this cast, by the way. So go go and check out the various comments that he's made here and so you can get the full context. And thinking of them as the keepers of the Elder Scrolls, I'm not sure to be honest, because the Dragon Breaks are the places where the Elder Scrolls don't work. So there's obviously some link between time and Dragon Breaks and the Elder Scrolls and how they function, but I don't think we know enough to make anything definite about them at this point and how they function there. But it's an interesting nod to think that the, the Molly are the keepers of the Elder Scrolls because that then associates the Elder Scrolls a bit more with the fundamental structures of Mundus and Magnus. It's something that is then outside of, beyond Akatosh. It's beyond that split of the eight that we see earlier. It's part of that one. So you have the Elder Scrolls as a distinct thing existing before you get to the eight, Adra, before you get to the Earthbones and gods as a fundamental part of how Mundus works, or before you get to Mundus, even. There's also one final note about the Nomoli I want to make before we go here, and that is they're also called the blue star in some cases. Nemoli is called a single being in the exegesis of the Meridnanda. And they also get talked about as multiple things. You've got in those quote in those quotes we mentioned earlier, star orphans pl plural, and Kirkbride consistently refers to them as they. I'm not sure that the distinction is too important, but I think that they could potentially be both. If you think about the Nimoli as functioning as something during a dragon break they can then navigate untime. They can do an awful lot of things without cause and effect. So they can do a lot of things at once. So you get even singular beings being functionally multiple beings within a dragon break because they can do many things at once in inverted commas. So the Nomoli could be 
one thing, they could be many, we don't really know, and I'm not sure it really matters. We've also got the Jills, as well as other things that are associated with Dragon Breaks. The most comprehensive statement that we have about them, it comes from one of MK's forum posts, uh, which describes them as a Jill is an archaic term for a female dragon. The Minute Menders would take on a suitably draconic form. And that Minute Menders is the key phrase here. The Jills are the things that knit time back together and keep time running on a steady course. So Dragon Breaks are, in a way, events where the Jills let things get out of hand, where they can't keep up and they can't keep stitching everything together. And so it's also potentially a reason why dragon breaks don't last forever, that you've got the Jills working in the background, doing all the work to kind of tie back, tie all the timelines back together, make everything into singular causal entities again. And that's why dragon breaks potentially come to an end. If you look at the vindication of the dragon break, the end of that particular piece of text, which talks about eventuality maybe becoming moot, is roughly the phrase. If you think about that, then one potential result of the Middle Dawn is that time could be broken completely, that there could be absolutely no return to linear time. And so the Jills could potentially be a reason why dragon breaks go back towards linear time that they are the ones kind of pulling everything back together. It's, oh, it's broken, it needs to be fixed. That's pretty much all that we know about the Jills. There's not a lot of text about them, and what we do know about them are generally snippets from Michael Kirkbride's comments in forums and here and there. In here and there. So exactly what they do is very uncertain, which is also very fitting for how Dragon Breaks work, I suppose. And that's pretty much it for this episode. Thank you ever so much for taking the time to listen. Uh, if you like this podcast, please subscribe on your favourite podcast catcher. We are now available on iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio and Player FM. And if you fancy a chat, please join in the discussions on the Written and Uncertainty Discord. And next time, having discussed what happens when the dragon breaks, I'll be discussing what happens when the dragon eats itself. Next time, we'll be asking, what are Kalpas and where did the Red Guards come from anyway? Until then, this podcast remains a letter written in uncertainty. You've been listening to Written in Uncertainty, a podcast written and presented by Aramithius, with some very kind editorial help from Cyfrey. The music for this cast is by Jan Glimbotsky. Check them out on SoundCloud at Songs from the Lost Land, and I'll see you next time.